listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1.30. Stay tuned next for Making Contact. This week on Making Contact. HIV is positive proof of social injustice in this country. It's time to recognize women are acquiring HIV independent of their behavior. In the United States... HIV AIDS is no longer just a disease affecting white gay men. The percentage of cases of women living with HIV has tripled in the past 20 years, and women of color are most affected. Yet outdated perceptions about the epidemic drive government prevention work, from the way data is collected to who gets tested. On this edition, those on the front lines of the grassroots HIV AIDS movement bring the discussion about HIV risk up to date. They say generating more relevant prevention models is literally a matter of life and death. I'm Tina Rubio, and this is Making Contact, a program connecting people, vital ideas, and important information. Women now make up almost a third of reported HIV cases in the U.S., and for many of them, their monogamous relationship was their risky behavior. 80% of women get the virus through heterosexual contact. Yet the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, has no category for these women. The government agency distributes $300 million a year to state and local health departments for prevention activities to high-risk populations. But are these funds getting to the people that need them? Correspondent Pauline Bartoloni has more. Sylvia Marte stuffs tortilla chips into a doggy bag after a meal she shared with a dozen other middle-aged women. Isn't this a perfect thing to do? <laughs> it's midday in a downtown Oakland, California office building, but Sylvia makes the space feel like her living room. She comes here to World, or Women Organized to Respond to Life-Threatening Disease, every Wednesday for a support group just for women living with HIV. You know, in the morning I get up and I'm like, oh, my God, I, am I going to make it? And so I start, like, my medicine, and that helps me go through the day. Sometimes they're good days. Sometimes they're bad. Each day, Sylvia must take 12 medications to stay alive. On top of her HIV, she has diabetes, high blood pressure, and just recently she recovered from Hodgkin's lymphoma. You wouldn't guess that Sylvia has had so many battles with her health. She walks down the hallway with a quick step and in constant dialogue with other world members. Mary, what are you doing? With a pierced eyebrow and short red dyed hair, she's a pretty hip 50 year old. She describes herself as one of the only white chicks in her low income West Oakland neighborhood where she once lived with the man who infected her with HIV. I thought Joe was the love of my life. Me and Joe um, got married and we fell in love. I thought this guy was the one that was going to make my life the most happiest moments. And it did. I can't say it didn't. Before me and Joe ever got into the relationship, I told them that in my family, three people passed because of the HIV. And so I said, then we have to be tested for HIV because I don't know what you did in your life. I don't, you don't know what I did in my life. So they both got tested twice. And both times they were negative. Then several years later, Joe got very sick. And we took him to the hospital, and he was in the hospital for two or three months. Nobody knew what was going on. And so when I saw him, I was like, oh, my God. Did the, what's the reason you're still here? What does the doctor say that's going on? And he says, I don't know what's going on. And I'm like, well, I need to talk to the doctor because I'm your wife legally, number one, and I need for you to get tested for HIV. And he's like, why? And I'm like, because you look like just like when you were my brother was dying. That was the face that I saw. Joe was shooting up in Puerto Rico, where they're both from, and Sylvia suspects that's how she got infected. They separated after she tested positive, but started up a relationship again when they both moved to California to get better treatment. He was there in 2005 when Sylvia was battling cancer. But when she recovered, he was using again. That's when, she said, their relationship was over for good. I wanted to kill that guy. I wanted to really, I said, you ruined my life. I told you that if you anything that you think you had something going on, you should have let me know. And I said to myself, I want to live. 
And if you don't want to live, that's your problem. I was hurt. I was betrayed. I felt like this should have not happened to me because I don't do drugs. I don't drink. I don't go to the streets to look for anybody. And I told them, no one is going to stop me now. Sylvia had already been going to World for counseling and was educating herself about living a healthy lifestyle. She feels empowered now to educate others, which she does informally with her neighbors in West Oakland. She's proud to have her face on HIV prevention billboards all around the San Francisco Bay Area. She wants people to know that older, Latina, heterosexual women can also get the disease. In fact, Latinas are getting infected at six times the rate of white women. Now, I know that everybody's going to die, but right now, I think he's got me here for one reason. God has me for a reason. The reason is to just tell, just to save somebody's life, just to tell somebody you're not alone, that if you want to go do your test and you test positive, there's life after HIV. This is after my yeah. At World, Community Outreach Coordinator Nana Kana helps clean up lunch from the Women with HIV counseling session. She says Sylvia's story is common. 80% of women with HIV get it from heterosexual contact. Perceptions of risk are really outdated. They still kind of go back to the 80s and the 90s when people thought... Men who have sex with men are at risk. Um, people who are sharing needles are at risk. You know, we see women all the time who are in, who are married, who are in monogamous relationships, who never saw themselves as being at risk, um, who are testing positive. When someone tests positive for HIV, they are put into risk categories by the provider, which gives the data to the Centers for Disease Control, or CDC. These risk categories include men who have sex with men, intravenous drug users, and those who are sexually involved with them. Almost everyone else is classified as no identified risk, including women in heterosexual relationships who are unaware of their partner's HIV status. Nearly 50% of women with HIV are considered to have no identified risk, according to World's Nana Kana. The consequences of about half of women in the U.S. testing positive falling into that category are enormous because funding resources are allocated depending on how you think people are getting infected. So that's how prevention resources are being allocated. That's how messages are being developed in the community. That's how interventions are being developed. But how do you create an intervention when you're saying, we don't know how you possibly could have gotten it? Kana says the current tracking system of women who are not considered at risk for HIV can lead to women getting late diagnoses and therefore having fewer medical options available to them. Officials at the CDC were not available for a recorded interview, but wrote that their HIV surveillance system could be updated to better document the 80% of women with HIV who are getting the virus through heterosexual sex. HIV is the biggest killer for African-American women between 25 and 34 years old, and black women account for two-thirds of women with the virus. Kenna of World says because the disease disproportionately affects women of color, more demographic data should be incorporated into the risk factor. It's not just about how many people you have sex with or what kind of substances you use. It can be about where you live. It can be about what are the incarceration rates where you are, what are the post-incarceration rates where you are. It can be about your social networks. Um, you know, if you're swimming in a pond with a lot of fish, you're more likely to run into another fish than if you're swimming in an almost empty pond. The CDC is working with the Council on State and Territorial Epidemiologists to modify how surveillance data is collected so that resources go to those at risk. At a Washington, D.C. press conference in October 2007, Carrie Brodus of the National Association of People with AIDS spoke about the CDC's HIV tracking system. We agree that evidence is crucial. We need to keep and we support keeping our eye on the ball. The point of surveillance is to stop the spread of HIV. It's time to recognize that the HIV epidemic among women is no longer fueled solely by personal behavioral risk. Women are acquiring HIV independent of their behavior. Meantime, Sylvia Marte gets up every morning and walks the streets of West Oakland talking to people about the disease. As part of a prevention program, she brings women of all ages in to get tested. In the past two weeks, she's brought in 25 people. 
And I told them, do you know your status? And they said no. And I said, would you like to know um, where you stand right now? And, and then when they come out of there, you see their faces, they're different. Because once anybody tells you you're negative, that's a good thing. And they hug me and they tell me thank you because I didn't think there was somebody that cared. For Making Contact, I'm Pauline Bartoloni in Oakland, California. now, AIDS has been the leading cause of death for African-American women between the ages of 25 to 34. But many HIV AIDS activists and health workers say that while the feminization of HIV AIDS may seem new, the issues behind who is at most risk of infection are not new at all. What's needed to decrease HIV infection rates, they say, is prevention justice. Making Contacts Puck Lowe has the story. When Wahida Shabazz L. found out five years ago that she was HIV positive, she immediately started working with Act Up Philadelphia and many other groups. As soon as I, I was diagnosed, I heard about Act Up Philadelphia. I heard that there were these people here in Philadelphia who were fighting for dignity for people with AIDS. And I didn't feel very dignified at all. So I actually went over just to get some dignity. And um, I wound up being there for quite a while. These days, Shabazz L. spends her time juggling conference calls, meetings, and coordinating national conferences. With her busy schedule, it's not always easy staying healthy living with HIV. But her activism is an inspiration to many. And her story represents a larger one, the changing forces of HIV-AIDS activism, centered around African-American women, a population that's seeing a steady increase in HIV infection. Within this huge pandemic, there is an epidemic still going on in this country for women of color. A major and unacknowledged factor that's contributing to the epidemic, according to HIV activists, is violence against women. Studies have shown that domestic abuse increases a woman's risk for HIV infection through forced sexual intercourse with an infected partner and by limiting women's ability to negotiate condom use. Shabazz L. elaborates. It's very hard to ask your husband to wear a condom. And especially if you're a woman who's experiencing violence. You know, it's almost impossible to have a man put a condom on while he has his hands around your throat. The oppression of women plays a huge role in the spread of HIV, but it doesn't end there. Shabazz L. says that institutional racism is the reason that the black community suffers disproportionately from HIV. What causes HIV to continue to infect people is the social inequalities, is the lack of housing opportunities, job opportunities, the lack of educational opportunities. We need structural interventions because the studies has already shown you can have an African-American community and you can have a white community and they have the same sort of behaviors, but it's the African-American community that gets the infection. Compounding the problems, say HIV activists, is that prevention funding, research and treatment programs are focused on men who have sex with men, and not enough on women of color. But this also affects gender variant and transgender people as well. And even though we say that HIV doesn't discriminate, we do find that the CDC does, and we do find the United States and the United States government does. Shabazz L. from Acts Up Philadelphia says that there's a hidden epidemic within the community that goes unaddressed. She cites an example of a transgender women's group that was denied funding by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC. The group had to identify as MSM, or men who have sex with men, but were later denied in the application process. La Gender in Atlanta actually applied for CDC funding, and they had to apply under MSM. And that is not how they refer to themselves and when they went through and realized that these were transgendered women, all of a sudden, the money was no longer available. Identifying patients by their expressed genders and orientations is crucial in fighting the AIDS epidemic, says Esther Lucero, HIV case manager of the Native American AIDS Project in San Francisco, California. 
She adds that medical providers need to give culturally competent care for patients of all races, genders, and orientations by removing shame and stigma from discussions about sexuality. Language around identity is key. To understand the fluidity of identity, sexual identity, gender identity. She says that as a society, we need to eliminate homophobia and shame from sexuality in order to practice truly safe sex. Ginger Virago, a harm reduction specialist in San Francisco, works with trans and gender variant clients. She agrees on the importance of identifying people by their expressed genders and orientations. Otherwise, she says, we lose the respect of the client sitting in front of us. And once that happens, you lose that person. Meantime, Kenyon Farrow is one person working to change how the public thinks and talks about HIV risk. He's with the Community HIV AIDS Mobilization Project, or CHAMP, a coalition of community and service organizations bridging HIV AIDS activism, human rights, and socio and economic justice. Farrow says that the dominant narrative around HIV AIDS doesn't factor in the impacts of poverty and racism in the epidemic. Instead, he says, mainstream media still focuses on the story of women who contract HIV from their male partners, men on the down low, that is, men who have public relationships with women and sex with men secretly. Farrow notes that National Institutes of Health Studies have shown that black so-called down-low men actually tend to have safer sex than black men who identify as gay. He says it's important to debunk the down-low myth and unpack the story's embedded heterosexist values. There's been no sort of missing link theory that high rates of HIV among black gay men and the high rates of HIV among black women is due to this down low character. It's been pretty much disproven at this point, but it still sort of circulates. And so, yeah, it does a couple things. I think one, obviously it stigmatizes black men. Black men are still seen as sexually dangerous um, and vectors of disease. Black gay men in particular are seen as vectors of disease because in the down low conversation, it's the down low man is getting the, the HIV from the gay man, right? But what it also does is I think stigmatizes black women um, in a way that says, well, you couldn't tell that your man was bisexual or whatever. So there's another level of stigmatization. The Prevention Justice Mobilization, an emerging campaign of HIV AIDS activists, service and advocacy groups, is coming up with solutions. Their strategy to combat HIV takes into account the inequalities that people in communities most affected by the epidemic face. Shabazz L. of CHAMP and ACT UP Philadelphia is part of it. She says HIV prevention needs to be understood as a human right. For many, many years, people with HIV would say HIV is just a virus. It's just like diabetes. It's just like, you know, any cancer. It's, it's a virus. And people were saying that because that was their way of trying to reduce the stigma. But what we've done in CHAMP, we have what we call prevention justice and the prevention justice framework tells us that HIV is not just a disease, it's not just a virus, but HIV is rooted in social disparities. HIV is positive proof of social injustice in this country. For Making Contact, this is Puck Lowe. You're listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. If you'd like more information or for CD copies of this program, please call 800-529-5736. That's 800-529-5736. You can also download programs or get our podcast at radioproject.org. Not only are HIV AIDS activists calling on institutions to change the response to the epidemic, they're generating positive prevention models from the grassroots. The Atlanta, Georgia-based Sister Love Organization focuses specifically on the needs of African-American women at risk of contracting HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases.
Through reproductive health education, housing support, and other services, Sister Love members get people comfortable talking about sex. Their approach is making safe sex fun. For the rest of our show, we'll hear a sound portrait of Sister Love, produced by Noah Chandler. We start off with a glimpse inside a safe sex workshop called The Healthy Love Party. <laughs> all right, ladies. Now, in the beginning, we all had got sexual fantasy names. And as I told you, ladies, time and time again, my name is Goddess Face Sitter. So as Goddess Face Sitter, my name is L. Nairobi my Nicole Moss, and I am the sexual world, and reproductive health educator and trainer at Sister Love Incorporated. Okay. This is called a dental dam. A dental dam is a thin sheet of latex. That is here, and this kind is vanilla, really, really cute, okay? <laughs> it's here for your oral enjoyment because a part of what we do at the Healthy Love Party is to make safer sex sexy, to make it erotic, and to make it fun so that it becomes part of your everyday sexual activity as opposed to becoming like something else or some obstacle, okay? Now, this dental dam from this lovely little sheet like this, as you guys can see, it's very thin, and I can do all of this. And you can see my lips clearly through this. Now, what you do is... This comes For a out. very long time now, I have been like the controversial figure in the Sister Love family. <laughs> um, and, and it's because I'm vulgar as hell. <laughs> and, um, and I'm very raw. And I'm okay with that. And in that, I do tend to get different levels of flack from different places. Because... Either it will be seen as unprofessionalism or it'll be seen as going too far or it'll be seen as, oh, you're, she's so overtly sexy or she's this, she's that. And I have to be concerned with, do I care about the three people that are going to have a problem with me or do I worry about the 50 that's going to take something back from this? You're going to lay this dental dam across the vagina. Now, on top of this dental dam, you can build whatever your partner likes to eat from ice cream sundaes to nuts and fruits and berries. And instead The way I've always approached education and, and presentation has never been from anybody else's model. You know what I'm saying? It's never been oh, I see how people do it this way and I'm going to do it that way. It's always been from what works for me. He can put honey on this here dental dam and that way you all can go to sleep when it's time and you ain't got to be the one to get up and go get the wet towel. How can we always got to be the one to get up and go get the wet towel? Anyway. When I speak out to do workshops and presentations and things like that, I talk to myself. And so I go through this education piece just discussing the things that I've learned. Just discussing the things that meant something to me. Because it's one thing to talk at somebody, but it's another to talk to them. And because I know I have a lot of sisters in the room that want to know this, I go around licking hands all over the world. So anybody in here want a cheap thrill? Come on, here we go. Abstinence only is problematic for us. That's policy that gets funding. And so there are lots of mandates out there, and it's problematic for us. Nobody's going to argue that abstinence is not the best way to eliminate the risk of HIV. That's not the argument. The argument is what about the rest of them? What about everybody else, the majority, that are not abstinent? And how dare you leave them out in the cold as if you're doing the right thing? In in uh, the earlier days of the Bush administration, you know, we had some serious conversations about what we were willing to compromise on and what we weren't just in order to survive as an organization and that's a really painful uh, and unjust place to be when you know that the work you are doing is working is accepted in your own community um, and me but your community is not the one that's going to be able to give you all the funds because it's the very community that has the most need we're just not working in a friendly environment when it comes to um, issues of power and choice and access. We also work specifically with HIV positive women doing training, mentoring and leadership development so that we have many more voices of black women living with HIV in the leadership and in the forefront. 
So they need to be sitting on boards of directors. They need to be sitting where, where we sit, like in the planning councils. They also need to be able to talk to legislators and local leaders, just like people do on their behalf. Validation inspires confidence and it, it gives you the words to talk the talk with the people who are talking, who have the power, who have the ability, and it gives you the ability to sit at the table with them and to get your needs met and articulated and help direct the growth of a movement and help you sit at the table because you're not at the table, you know. You don't get to impact places where change happens. But in order to do that, to, to talk that talk, we also had to walk that walk. So one of the first things we did was we changed our bylaws and then we honored them by um, creating a board of directors that was no less than 70% people, women particularly, but people living with HIV. My name is Lisa Diane White and I am the program manager for Sister Love Incorporated. Black women have this reputation of being like super sexy, um, oversexed, hot and top Venuses, just almost whores and really we're quite conservative around sex and there are many women who are quite conservative around sex and the community as a whole does not encourage the conversation of sex and so to begin to talk about sex as if they had control over it, that they had um, ownership of it when they really didn't. We thought that what had happened in the, when the white gay men started coming up with solutions for their community, that they thought all we had to do was use those same solutions and they would work in the black women's community. But then when you transfer that those models to black women, it's like black women don't have all of the control over sex. The power and control one has from the privilege of being white and male, even if they're homosexual, they still have more power and privilege than black females. The nature of this disease is that it's ever-changing. So if we do not stay on top of it, I mean, we've had to learn how to, to speak the language, do evaluation. You know, I'm in school, you know, I'm in a community-based organization. I'm also learning, you know, the rigors of evaluation and research so that someone knows that this is a trend. It's not just me. Well, this is what I know. Listen to me. You know, it's, this disease is changing daily. You know, how it came out 10 years ago, 25 years ago, it's, it's not the same. You know, who it impacted first is not the same. 25 years and now it's impacting us. HIV is not fighting fair. And I don't see why we should have to either. Passive non-aggressive, politically correct tactics aren't working. Because if they have, or if they were, we'd be in a much different place than we are right now. That's it for this edition of Making Contact. Special thanks to independent journalist Pauline Bartoloni for producing this show. And thanks to Dan Turner, Ron Rucker, and the Monday Morning Breakfast crew. Our theme music is by the Charlie Hunter Trio. For a CD copy of program number 4807, call the National Radio Project at 800-529-5736. Or you can get our podcast at radioproject.org. Lisa Redman is our executive director, Puck Lowe, associate producer, Samson Rainey, Joaquin Palomino, and Elena Botkin Levy, interns, and I'm senior producer Tina Rubio. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. The 37th annual KPFA Crafts and Music Fair is the only public venue where you can see a very special collection of beautiful quilts made for homeless and infirm children. Children's Quilts, a project of the East Bay Heritage Quilters Guild, provides over 1,000 quilts annually to children who are homeless, born drug addicted, or living with HIV and AIDS. 
These colorful quilts are distributed to Bay Area shelters, hospitals, and foster care networks, providing comfort and cheer to those most in need. We invite you to view this exhibit of children's quilts and participate in our interactive sewing area where you and your kids